Looks like we are now live. And I, am I now sharing? Yep. Um, actually, can you stop sharing just so I can share a couple of intro slides? Absolutely. Happy to. Um, let's see. It looks like everyone is joining us. I can see the attendees popping up. Um, so I'm just going to give it like a minute just so everyone can join. Is this a, is this a um, like a presentation style? Or we don't see everybody's faces? Yeah, so we're in webinar, so we won't get to see everyone's faces. But they can always unmute at the end if they want to. Can you let me know if my um, my, my audio starts to degrade and I'll turn off my video? OK, sure. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen. And let's see, it looks like we're still going up for attendees. So we'll give it just another second. All right, it's starting to level off. So I'm just gonna get started. Um, welcome everyone. I'm just going to quickly turn my video on just so you all know <laughs> that I am here. Um, welcome to our first official webinar of 2021. Um, thank you all for tuning into our program this morning focused on Hemlock Willi Adelgid planning and management in Sydney Atlas. Um, we are excited to have Carrie Marshner and Frank Moses here to talk about Hemlock Willi Adelgid in Skinny Atlas. Um, so we are in webinar mode. Um, so you are all muted right now. However, um, at the end, um, when we take questions, you can use the raise hand feature and I can unmute you. Um, you can also type in any questions that you have throughout the presentation um, in either the chat or Q&A function. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be um, sharing that with you all, and I will um, send you an email at the end with a um, link to all that information. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, so my name is Camille Marcotte, and I am the Water and Ecology Educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Onondaga County. Um, we are part of the nationwide extension system, um, which in New York State is run through Cornell University. And Cornell Cooperative Extension has a presence in every New York State county, and we provide um, research based resources, information and trainings to community members, and we cover a variety of different topics, including 4-H, agriculture, horticulture, nutrition, and natural resources. Our Skinny Atlas Lake um, education program works to protect the water quality in Skinny Atlas Lake and is funded by the city of Syracuse. Um, we do that through offering workshops and training, and training like this one, as well as conducting outreach to stakeholders and sharing information about the lake and water quality through social media, our newsletters, and the Skinny Atlas Lake website, which if you haven't checked it out, you can visit scanlakeinfo.org and check that out. Um, so I am going to now turn it over to Carrie Marshall. Marshall. Carrie is the Invasive Species Extension Associate with the University of Hemlock Initiative at Cornell University. And can take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, it sounds good. Great. And I can see your screen. <laughs> Great. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we're gonna to talk about hemlock woolly adelgid and how to manage it and um, where it is at in Skinny Atlas watershed right now. Um, we are here in partnership with Camille. Thank you so much for having us today. Also with the Finger Lakes Prism, which is your local regional invasive species management association. They do amazing work and I encourage you to, to check, out, check out their programs. They do a lot of great stuff. 
And our funders are New York State DEC, the US Forest Service, um, USDA APHIS, and the EPA. In case any of you are um, less familiar with the, the wonderful things that hemlocks do for us, let me walk you through that. Um, hemlocks are what we call a foundation species. They are very abundant and they um, create the foundation on which the rest of the ecosystem is, um, is constructed. They fill a pretty unique niche, especially in our Finger Lakes region. Um, they really, in this area, they're mostly growing in steep slopes, and shady areas, and that means our gorges um, in many cases. They like riparian areas, they like wet areas, and they're one of our only deeply shade tolerant evergreens. Um, they're specially adapted so that their needles can take just the tiniest little sun fleck that comes through the canopy and photosynthesize with it, with it which is why you often see them holding needles farther down into the canopy than, um, than, our, other, than our other evergreens. They support a, a food web. Um, lots of different animals and plants depend on them for food or for shelter. If you walk into a hemlock grove in the summertime, you will feel that you walk into this cool, quiet space. The air underneath a hemlock canopy is up to 10 degrees centigrade cooler in the summertime than the air above the canopy. So it provides a really nice cool refuge for animals in the summertime. In the wintertime, when you go into a hemlock grove, you'll notice that there's less wind under the, that canopy and it's a, maybe a little bit warmer. And so it's also a great refuge in the wintertime from harsh winter conditions. And I, somebody last week told me that um, they've heard the hemlock referred to as the ever feeding tree because they have these loose, slightly um, floppy, bendy branches. And as the snowpack goes up on the snowy winter, um, the, the hemlock branches get pulled down where um, things like deer can continue to browse on them as the winter progresses. They also um, are very important for our aquatic ecosystems. Um, hemlocks, because they're evergreen, they're actively growing and pulling water up out of the ground in the spring and the fall when we have an overabundance of water. And then in the summertime, when we're often in drought conditions, they are not growing as much because they're competing with the, with the um, hardwood trees like the maples and the peach and the birch. And so they aren't pulling as much water in the summer when we have drought conditions. And that difference between the, the hemlocks and the hardwoods helps stabilize stream flows throughout the year so that watersheds that have hem hemlocks in them that aren't infested with HWA actually have more stable stream flows throughout the year than ones where HWA has impacted the hemlocks. Um, they also help keep streams cold, which is especially important right in our area because we're right on the edge of what those cold water fish assemblages, which support our trout that we love to fish for, um, meet. And so the hemlocks do that in a couple of ways. They hold snow under that canopy a little later into the spring. So they're providing snow melt recharge into the streams later into the spring, which helps keep temperatures cool. They also provide direct shade to the streams that also helps keep them cool. They because they're evergreen, they, they're, um, their needles are acidic and the hemlock needles are particularly slow to degrade. And so you wind up with this thick duff. If you go underneath a hemlock, um, an old hemlock grove, you can feel this springy ground that can be feet and feet of um, old hemlock needles. That creates a really unique soil profile and the runoff from that 
creates a pretty unique water chemistry that supports a different a different collection of species than yeah, than you find under the hardwood trees nearby. So over three quarters of New York's forests are owned and managed um, by private, private landowners. And so private landowners are a critical part of the conversation for any forest management or forest conservation goal in New York and hemlock conservation is, is no Hemlocks, you might not, this might surprise you if you live here in Finger Lakes, um, but hemlocks are the third most common tree species in New York. And if you look up in this area where you're seeing that reddish color, the, the red pixels are where hemlocks are more than 60% of the, the trees in that area. So that southeastern, Adirondack region, Tug Hill, and a little bit in the Catskills. A lot of hemlock down there. And there's also a lot of hemlock in this southern Finger Lakes. Now it looks, when you look in, in here, you can see there's, there's some but not a ton of hemlock. And it looks like there's no hemlock at all in the Lake Plain and in the central Finger Lakes. But that's not true. We actually have a lot of hemlock in our gorges. But when you build a model, like this one was built um, by DEC. It's an excellent model, but they did it with aerial photography and it just doesn't pick up the stuff in the gorges very well. And that's why we're not seeing that higher hemlock distribution in this area. So there's a lot of hemlock in the Finger Lakes area. Um, there's a lot of hemlock around Skinny Atlas Lake. And it's a really important part of our ecosystem here. And what we don't want is for our Skinny Atlas watershed to look like this. Um, this is Pisgah National Forest, and they have lost almost all of their hemlocks. Um, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, um, they are working very hard uh, using chemical treatments to preserve just 1% of their hemlocks. And the reason that they're doing that is this pest, hemlock oleodelgid, which we're here to talk about today. This is an invasive pest of hemlock trees. Now I'm going to start by giving you a big picture view. Um, these, are, they, these are all the places where hemlocks are native all around the world. Um, there's a few species in Asia. There's a couple more species in far eastern Asia and Japan. And then there's two species here in the Pacific Northwest. And then we have our two species here. Um, in New York, we have Eastern hemlock, but there is a very small distribution of Carolina hemlock um, down, down in, the, in the Southeastern US. Every other area except us has a native hemlock woolly adelgid, which means that the trees are a little more adapted to this kind of, the kind of damage that this piercing sucking insect causes. But probably more importantly, all of these areas have um, HWA, hemlock woolly adelgid predators that manage these populations. And we are the unlucky lottery losers that did not have a native hemlock woolly adelgid pest. And so when it arrived here, it's been causing serious problems. Hemlock woolly adelgid arrived in the 80s in New York City and started spreading north and west from there. Um, the lower Hudson region is pretty thoroughly infested. You can still find a few pockets that, um, that have healthy hemlock because the HWA hasn't arrived there yet, but mostly the lower Hudson is in pretty rough shape. Um, the Catskills, it depends, in the southern Catskills, there's a lot of mortality already. Northern Catskills still look um, okay. And we saw this in the Finger Lakes in the very, very late 90s. I think, and, um, and then it just kept moving, moving west. Actually, these two infestations, do you see these little dense areas around Rochester and Buffalo? Those didn't spread, those weren't spread from New York City. Those were, um, those were infested independently from people who purchased um, hemlock stock that was 
grown in the Mid-Atlantic region and arrived on their properties already infested with HWA. And then that HWA spread from there. So what is this bug and how does it live so that we can know more about how to manage it? Um, this, this is what, when you look at an infested tree, this is what you see. Um, here's the hemlock twig and all these little white woolly bundles. That's the HWA infestation. This is, um, hang on, it looks like these white, waxy, woolly looking masses on the hemlock twigs, on the twigs, usually at the base of the needle, but not on the needles. This is what the actual insect looks like if you uh, magnify it a lot. Um, it's usually brownish or blackish, and this crazy looking straw like part that looks like one of those curly straws you would give your child. That is their mouth part that they drill down into the hemlock twig. And they drill down into the cells where the, the tree is storing starch for its own use. And then it eats, eats that starch. Um, and then these little white, black and white pores up here, that's where they create that wool. That, you, that is what you see. And we think that they do that certainly to create kind of a habitat for them to live in because they spend their whole lives underneath that little woolly bundle. Um, and probably also to, to protect them from desiccation. In the South, uh, trees that are, that are infested with HWA are dying in four to 10 years. They go down very quickly in the South um, because the population just increases and increases and increases. Um, up here in New York, we have colder winters and so the population will go up and then we have a cold winter and it gets knocked back and gives our trees a break for a year or two. And then it comes back, the population comes back and then we have a cold winter. So here it's taking more like six to 20 years to kill, to kill our hemlock trees. I'm gonna talk a little bit about their life cycle and why there's such a problem here. So adelgids have really complicated life cycles, but let's just, um, take the, the basic piece, which is that we have two generations in New York, all female, no males. It's all females and all asexual reproduction. We have one generation that um, the eggs are laid in the late spring, early summer, and then they, they continue all the way through winter. This is the overwintering generation. And then in the late winter, early spring, a spring generation is eggs are laid and then they develop very rapidly. And then those guys are the ones that lay these um, early summer eggs to start the next overwintering generation. When, when HWA hatches from their eggs, they look like this cute little brown thing crawlers, and this is the only stage for HWA that can move. Um, they hatch, they crawl off to find a, a good location to insert their stylet, and once they've inserted their stylet, they can never move again. And in fact, if they're removed or dislodged from the twig, they, they die because they can't reinsert their mouth parts into a new location. In the summer, that overwintering generation, when they settle in the summer, they go into this dormant phase all summer long where they look like this tiny little thing. And they, we call this estivation. They estivate until mid fall, and then they wake up and start growing. Uh, the spring generation doesn't estivate. They just settle and they immediately start growing. This is what those oversummering HWA look like. And this is, this is why we don't usually go out looking for them in the summer, um, because they're really small and they're really hard to see. So if you're gonna go out and look for them in the summertime, maybe bring a magnifying glass. There they are, those little sesame seed-like things there. Then they wake up in the fall um, or in the spring, they just immediately start growing. They um, 
start producing wool and then they start looking like this. These are these are mature um, mature HWA. And this is the leftover wool from the last year's HWA. You see these little scraps of wool on the older twigs. So you can look for older infestations any time of year and just look for this older wool, but it's easier to see this than the new growth. So they're doing this from November through about June. The adults, once they're fully mature, they lay 50 to 100 eggs a piece. And now just to recap, so that we, we're, we, we get this settled in our brains, um, uh, that overwintering generation, they estivate all summer, and then they wake up in the fall and start growing. And then in the early spring, they lay eggs and their daughters settle in amongst their mothers. And they start growing and producing wool producing eggs. And so in that late spring period, you have both generations actively growing and producing eggs. And then that spring generation lays its eggs so that they hatch just as hemlock is putting on that beautiful lime green growth that they put on in late May, early June. And so that the new overwintering generation crawls out onto the new growth and settles there. So what, the reason we're having such a hard time with this insect is that they reproduce asexually so that one insect can start a new infestation. They have two generations per year, so two opportunities for exponential growth. And there are no native predators, so there's no population management to stop that exponential growth. And that's why we have no population control here. So what kills our trees isn't an individual HWA feeding on the starch that the tree is producing. What kills our HWA is a heavy population like this. Um, and what happens is that each one of those insects has caused a little wound to the tree by putting in their, their feeding mouth parts. And the tree busily walls that off with scar tissue and that's not a big deal if you have one or two or three HWA on your twig. But when you have this, pop, this um, high population of HWA, there's so much scar tissue from the damage that they've caused that our hemlock trees can't get any sap out to the end to make new twigs. So they can't make any new needles. So they can't get any more food. And that is what actually kills our trees, is that they're not able to make new needles and um, make food for themselves, and they eventually starve. So how do you manage this pest? There are two, and if you take the global view, there are two options. There's chemical management and biological management. There are two options for chemical management for anything that's bigger than a hemlock hedge. If you, if you have a hedge on your property that's low and you can reach the top of it, you can use horticultural oil because you can reach the whole tree. But most of our trees are way too tall for that option. And so what, you're, what, what you have available is imidacloprid, which is a slow acting chemical. Um, it takes about a year to become effective, but it lasts or somewhere from three to seven years, depending on the condition of your tree and um, how much stress it's under from, from other sources. There's also dinotefuran, which works within a few weeks. It's very fast acting, but it only lasts for a year. Imidacloprid is widely available. Um, there is a soil drench um, version of this that's available for anybody to use. And then there are several other formulations that are only available to um, commercial pesticide applicators. Dinotefuran is only available to um, professional applicators. We really encourage what we consider to be the best management practice for this pest, which is a basal bark application. And you can see this gentleman is, he's roped in because he's on a steep slope. He's got a backpack and he's applying chemical just to the, um, the six feet of um, bark 
right here at the base of the tree. It's called basal bark application. We really like this method because it's very targeted. The, the chemical soaks in through the bark, goes into the vascular system, like the circulatory system of the tree, and then it's moved throughout the tree that way. And this way, it's only going into the hemlock tree. If you do a soil drench application, then that chemical is going into the soil and it can get picked up by any plant that has roots in that area. So it's a less targeted application method. And that's why we prefer this basal bark application method. So imidacloprid um, is nice because it targets the nervous system of insects, which is very different from the nervous system of mammals. And so there's not a lot of off-target impact to mammals from this, uh, this class of chemical. Um, imidacloprid is not, it's a, it's a broad spectrum insecticide. And so if you put it out on the landscape broadly, it does have an impact on pollinators. But hemlock trees are wind pollinated. They produce nectar and their pollen is not of interest to pollinators. And that's why we, um, we are comfortable recommending this chemical in a forest application on this tree because it's not a situ, if, if you're going to apply imidacloprid in the environment, this is one of the safest places to do it for your pollinators. Also the imidacloprid is long lasting, so you don't have to apply it as often, which is also a benefit. Um, I just want to open the chat so I can see what's happening. Um, so when you're just considering whether to treat or whether or not to treat, you have to remember that not treating is not um, a no, no risk decision because if you don't treat your hemlock trees, they're going to die. And um, that, that can damage and change the ecosystem by itself. And so when you're thinking that the treatment prevents the changes that occur when you lose this important tree from your forest. So when you're weighing the risks and benefits of the two, you have to consider the risks of doing nothing and letting your trees die versus the relatively minimal risks of, of um, treating your trees and keeping them alive. Um, and responding to Michael, no, we don't suggest that you pre-treat with a metacloprid because it, because it is adding this this chemical into the environment. And it's um, because the, the hemlocks are going down relatively slowly in our state, you have several years, as long as you watch carefully and make sure that you catch the HWA early, you can just wait until the HWA shows up and then treat. To, um, and we've seen, we, we recommend treatment um, for trees until they have less than 30% of their canopy left. Um, so they have to be pretty sick before they won't bounce back. But if you are treating your tree because you think it's a beautiful lush tree, you should make sure to treat it early because once it loses that lower canopy, which is mostly what you can see from your house, um, that will take a very long time to come back. And so make sure you treat it early enough that the foliage that you want to preserve from an aesthetic perspective is still relatively healthy. If you have a larger property, you have the, the question of where to manage because treatment costs, if you use just the imidacloprid, it's a, between 70 cents to a dollar per diameter inch. So that's the diameter of your tree at about chest height. You know, a little tree like this is going to be, sorry, like this, maybe three or four inches. So three or four dollars. If you have a big 12 inch tree, it's going to be more like $15. And if you have, if your property is very steeply sloped, it'll be more because um, 
it's more dangerous for the applicator and they will wanna rope in and it's just a higher labor cost. If you add the, the dinotepuran, the quick, quick acting thing, which you would wanna do if your trees are already pretty sick um, or it's a really heavy infestation, that's more like 250 per diameter inch. So it's a manageable price. You can definitely treat your trees, but if you have a whole hemlock forest, you're gonna have to be selective and say, which trees are you gonna treat and which trees are you gonna let go? Um, so what stands do you protect? We, we recommend an initial decision tree of four questions. Are you at the leading edge of an infestation? You should probably treat. Um, so in the skinny atlas um, context, maybe if you're in the north, northern portion of skinny atlas and you discover the OHWA, we would recommend, we would really encourage you to go ahead and treat. Um, if you have a remnant of old growth, um, that's really a rare and precious thing. And unless there's a really compelling reason not to, we would suggest that you treat those beautiful, huge old trees. Um, the old growth ecosystems are very different from the ecosystems that are over most of our landscape and they, um, they are, are worthy of conservation. If you're gonna be taking your trees out anyway, um, don't, don't treat them. And then any other stands, we would suggest that you, you walk through a thought process to, um, to think about the pros and cons of that particular stand. Here's the things that we think you should consider um, or that you can consider. Um, how healthy is the stand? How big is it? Bigger stands you'd probably wanna treat because if you, and denser stands you'd probably wanna treat because it's going to be more disruptive to lose those than it would just a few hemlock trees within a larger matrix of hardwood trees. Um, are they under other environmental stress? Maybe they're looking pretty sad because they're in a really dry location those might not be the best trees to prioritize. Um, I, we, we suggest that you start looking near water um, for HWA because it often arrives on bird's feet. They fly into a new place and they've landed on a hemlock before and the little crawlers have crawled under their feet and then they land near the water to drink. And we hypothesize that then the, the crawlers crawl off and settle on the new tree. And we think that's why we often see new infestations in your water. I'm gonna skip the genetic diversity because it's not um, applicable at this scale. If you have trout in your stream, you, that's probably an important place to conserve your hemlock because of all the things we talked about with the cool, cool water and the stable stream flows. Trees that provide direct shade to your water. Um, at risk water quality, if, if, you're, if you're, you're already having problems in your stream, um, you might wanna consider prioritizing management in that area. I would also say if you're a drinking water watershed, it's probably important to conserve your trees and skinny atlas like. Um, I'm gonna skip stream flashiness. Um, from a forest perspective, if you have a, a forest that you can have some pretty old trees, uh, it may have been cut, but it was never plowed. Uh, that's what's considered primary forest. It's not old growth, but, but it was never completely disturbed. And a lot of our gorges are like that. And those are, those are valuable ecosystems. If you have a hemlock swamp, um, that's a pretty rare ecosystem. If you have rare species on your property, that depend on hemlock, we have a list if you wanna look at it. Um, we would recommend prioritizing really nice forest over um, kind of trashy, heavily invasive, in, heavily invaded with invasive species forest. Um, steep slopes, the loss of hemlocks from your watershed can increase the flashiness of your streams. I think we talked about that earlier, and that can increase erosion. Maybe not, you know, specifically where the hemlocks were lost, but throughout your watershed. 
And so steep slopes might be a good place to consider treatment. On the other hand, um, the steeper the slope, the more expensive it is to treat. And so steep slopes are kind of a complicated topic. And of course, you would want to prioritize trees that are near your roads, near your trails, near your buildings, the places where you love to picnic, um, the places where you love to go look out over your lake. Um, those are all important options. We actually have a tool to help you think through this. Um, if you have a large property, this might be worth doing. Um, we have a, a Word document you can just read through and it, it talks about each of the, the considerations that I just walked you through in more detail so that you can think about them in the, in the context of your property. There's also an Excel spreadsheet. If you want to, you can go through and um, put in each of your stands and score them uh, for as many of those traits as, as you have information for. You don't have to do them all. There's a ton of them. It's a sort of a kitchen sink approach. You just pick the stuff that you know the answers to um, and then compare the scores at the end and the ones with the higher scores are more important. And the ones with the lower scores are maybe the ones you should let go. We tried this at the Coming Nature Center near Rochester. Um, and this was a really interesting test case because when Nathan called me, the, the manager for this property and said, we're pretty sure we wanna, we wanna manage, we wanna treat all the hemlocks along our stream because we're really worried about our stream quality and we wanna support the water quality in the watershed. And then as we walked his property um, and talked about the, looked at the stands and talked about them, we realized that he was on really flat flat, flat um, air sloped land that was unlikely to erode. Um, and that over here, away from the water, he had a primary forest stand that was a hemlock swamp that had a globally rare uh, spreading globe flower growing in it. And that turned out to be hands down the most important um, stand to treat. And then, and then the other ones just fell out very differently than he was thinking before he had thought about the different considerations that might be relevant. Um, I work for the New York State. I'm going to step away from treatment and talk about biological control for a little bit. I work for the New York State Hemlock Initiative. We are the ones who are conducting research on biological control for hemlock oleodelgin in New York. Um, Biological control from, from a long-term perspective is maybe one of the only options for long-term management of HWA because none of us can just keep treating our trees forever. Um, and biological controls is releasing a predator, a pathogen, or a parasite that lives in the environment and keeps the population of a pest down to Below, below the threshold that causes severe damage to whatever you're trying to protect. Um, pine trees, crops, and in our case, hemlocks. So it's a long-term solution. It's a landscape scale solution, um, but we are still very much in the research stages of figuring out a biological control for hemlock oleodelgin. Right now we're working with two different kinds of insect. They're both predators. HWA doesn't have um, a disease or a parasite that is specific enough to bring into, into a new ecosystem and let go. Um, the only things that are really specific enough to adelgids are these um, predators of, of the hemlock bully adelgid. So one of them is the Laracobius beetles. They're little adelgid eating beetles. Um, the one that we work with the most is native to the Pacific Northwest and it feeds on that overwintering generation. We've released about 17,000 of them and we've got an establishment, we've confirmed establishment at seven sites. Um, if you think about confirming that a population is established, that means 
you have to go out into this forest of very tall hemlock trees and happen to find one of these beetles that mostly live higher up in the trees. And so it can take us many years to find an established population. So far we've found seven. And a lot of those, I'm happy to report, are in the Finger Lakes, not in Skinny Atlas Watershed. Um, we also are working with silver flies. This is a much newer insect to us. They're also from the Pacific Northwest and they feed on eggs and they feed on both the eggs of the winter generation and the spring generation. This is really important for us because that spring generation, whatever we do to the winter generation, the spring generation gives this insect an opportunity for exponential growth to bounce back from any, any um, population reduction that happened in the winter. So a spring feeder is really critical for us. We've released about 16,000 of them. We did do at least one small release in the Skinny Atlas watershed but it was very small and it was so small, it didn't even make it onto our map. So this is where we've released so far um, with our program. Uh, the red is where HWA is. Uh, this, there's more here than on this map that was found in 20, fall of 2020 and hasn't made it onto our map yet. Um, so we've done a lot of releases in the Finger Lakes region uh, and down in the lower Hudson in the Catskills. And we now have one release up here. And um, yeah. So what we do is that we collect foliage from the Pacific Northwest. We bring it to a special quarantine facility because we don't want to release the West Coast version of HWA on the East Coast. That's not the version that we have here. We have the Japanese version is the one that arrived here. And, uh, we, and then we wait for the, the biocontrol insects to mature, and then we collect them and wait for them to grow up into adults, and then we release them here or conduct research on them. So the research timeline for biocontrols is that first you go to wherever your horrible invasive pest came from and research which predators or or parasites might be appropriate for um, biocontrol. And then you go through an extensive permitting process with USDA. They're very careful about what they're willing to allow to be brought in to um, try to manage a pest. And then once you have that very large piece done, um, then, then you can start releasing predator and seeing if it will manage your pest. And that we're, we're still in that early research stage of seeing if these pests are going to work. So how, how can you help? Um, one of the most important things you can do off of your property is report HWA when you find it. Um, this, is a, this is probably one of the best um, examples of this is this Lake George find. So this summer, a gentleman from Long Island was uh, camping at a campground in Lake George. And he said, I see HWA on this hemlock. I've got that in my yard. I know what it looks like, but I didn't think it was up here. I'm just going to report that in the IMAP Invasives website, which is the website where uh, New York State collects all of their location information for invasive species. And um, DEC was notified right away and they came out and um, eventually found, confirmed the infestation. And um, the Adirondack Park Prism, the Capitol Mohawk Prism, Lake George Land Conservancy, DEC, and um, our New York State Hemlock Initiative staff spent like six weeks uh, surveying around there and delineating the infestation and then DEC treated there in the fall. Um, but we would not have known that this infestation was there if it hadn't been for a private citizen providing that information into IMAP. And that's why we're so, we've been gung-ho about this for years, but this is a great uh, example of why, why we're so gung-ho. So there's the new infestation. It's a pretty disappointing that that's there. Okay, 
So this is the situation right now uh, for skinny atlas. Um, these are older infestations that we've known about mostly for a while. This whole lakeshore we just found out was infest infested because our Central New York HWA Hunters team led by Steve Kinney um, surveyed out here. He found it almost everywhere he looked uh, on, that, on that Eastern shore, except, except it up in these more Northern areas. Um, but you can see there's not a lot of survey that's been done up here either. We have one negative survey and we have a couple negative surveys up here towards the, towards the Northern end, but we don't really know what's happening up in here. And the, so it would be great to, to know more about about what the HWA populations are like in this northern portion of the watershed. If you're a landowner, um, we, we really encourage you to look at your property, find your hemlock trees, survey for HWA at least once a year. And then once you find it, treat uh, and keep your, trees, treat, keep your trees healthy. If you're a community member, um, we encourage you to go places where there are hemlocks, survey, and report it to IMAP Invasives. Closing thoughts are, um, originally we were hoping that maybe not the Finger Lakes, but at least the Adirondacks would be spared from HWA because it was just too cold up there. And there are two things that are happening that make that not the case. Um, one is that our winters are less reliably cold, and the other one is that the um, HWA is evolving to, to be adapted to colder winters at the northern end of its range. Surveys and treatments are critical. Biocontrol is one of the best long-term solutions. And that's what I have. Visit our website for that prioritization tool um, or to look at our volunteer programs. And shoot me an email if you have any questions that we can't answer. And I'm going to hand it over to Frank. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Frank Moses, who is the executive director of the Skinny Atlas Lake Association to talk about um, a really exciting funding um, opportunity that they've just received. Great, thanks, thanks Camille. Um, I'm gonna speak briefly. Is this, is this sharing uh, probably more screen, not my full screen, this is sharing this is interesting that's uh, giving you- Right now, I see it in presenter mode and it, yeah, but I can see your slides. Yeah, that's all right. I don't mind uh, anyone seeing the next slide. I, I, that was extremely informative. Uh, really appreciate all your help and keep an eye on- Give folks a, uh, just an update on, um, uh, am I still here or did Zoom quit on um, I can still see you. I think you're muted though, Frank. Okay, that's odd. All right, thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, technical difficulties uh, wanting to kick me off. So um, it said Zoom stopped unexpectedly. So that's always fun. I, I just wanted to give, give um, everyone a quick update. We're still working with Onondaga County Soil Water Conservation District, who uh, is the lead on this project. Uh, the Skinny Atlas Lake Association, when we saw issues with this that were brought up by, by our members, um, Ron and uh, Roseanne Gay uh, were, were extremely uh, concerned about what was going on. Mary Menapace, our former board member, brought uh, this to our attention and, and we wanted to see if we could do something. So we connected with Onondaga County Soil Water Conservation District and uh, used some of our legacy funds from our, our donors supporting that to uh, help uh, pay for um, Soil Water Conservation District's time to apply to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative uh, through the USDA US Forest Service um, to see if we can bring some funds in. And so uh, there's still the use of the funds uh, will be managed by by Soil Water Conservation District. So they'll be the best to answer of our, our path forward and using that uh, $50,000, which will be uh, focused on mainly Skinny Atlas Lake and also parts of Atisca Lake that we'll still be looking to, um, you know, uh, 
sample and survey uh, that area. I'm, I'm really interested in uh, what Willow Creek at Atisco Lake has uh, that's a main in, inflow there. Uh, but the good news is uh, that it's also being given attention on Owasco Lake uh, where uh, having both lakes, Atisco and Owasco to our east and west, having that buffer for these critters that don't uh, know our watershed boundaries. Uh, so that makes me feel more comfortable that uh, we can maybe begin to attack this. Um, it's been an issue for a long, long time. Um, uh, back in the, I don't know if my slides are advancing or not. Uh, there we go. Uh, you know, Bob Warner, who we sadly lost last year back in the 70s said, if we lose the hemlocks, we lose the lake. Uh, and that's becoming more uh, of a concern now, especially with harmful algal blooms, where we know uh, the root structures of these of these trees help uh, keep keep the soil, uh, keep the sediment from eroding. Uh, Frank, and, I'm not seeing your slides, just so you know. Lovely. Um, so let me try and escape out of this and reshare. Um, thanks for that heads up, Camille. Um, but that's okay. I, I don't want to take too much time. I want to leave. Uh, if my slides aren't showing, that's quite all right. I just had some uh, shots of the, um, the uh, uh, you know, Bob speaking and then also some of these steep ravines. Um, and I, I think I lost my controls uh, a little bit here, Camille, um, but that's okay. And so the, the basic of, of this is that we wanted to do something we're working with Soil Water Conservation District and we're, we're looking at working with our partner, community partners, uh, Finger Lakes Land Trust, Central New York Land Trust, Lourdes Camp, all signed letters of support to see what we can do together. We need to look at uh, how far this $50,000 can go to protect our watershed and see what, what more we need for the community. Um, so I just wanted to, when I saw uh, when Camille was hosting this, that it would be good to uh, help answer the question of what are we doing on Skinny Atlas Lake? Um, and, and wanted to thank uh, you know, Cornell Cooperative Extension for hosting a, a previous uh, workshop with Steve Kinney um, and, and for uh, Roseanne Gay being at the parking lot and saying, I'm, I'm waiting here to see it. Uh, this is at High Hickory with Central New York Land Trust and Albert Yerger was on. Thanks for opening up your properties to take a look too. And Roseanne had said, I'm waiting to see if someone from Skinny Atlas Lake Association is here because we need to take care of this problem. And, and this is the time to take care of it as this is showing up. Um, so it's gonna take uh, a full community and a lot more outreach, uh, working with Cornell Cooperative, uh, working with all, all the folks. I see Travis Glazier from the Office of the Environment with Onondaga County. Uh, they're doing so much against these terrestrial invasives. Uh, so thanks for all your work, uh, Teresa Link, uh, who's from Soil Water Conservation District. Teresa, thanks for everything you've been doing. Um, we're just, we're ready to go and ready to tackle this and, and look at how we can do this um, with our neighboring lakes too, so we can have a good uh, buffer. Uh, and last thing I wanted to mention um, that I, uh, maybe we can do is follow up, Camille, but Dana Hall uh, was our board member uh, with Scanals Lake Association. Dana is going to be speaking this Saturday at the Bob Brower Science Symposium on Owasco Lake. Dana has been not only looking at our lake, seeing what we can, he can do here, but also as president of the Owasco Watershed Lake Association, really getting after Owasco Lake. So if you wanna learn more about uh, what he's been doing, how he's connected with, with Kerry Marshner and Steve Kinney and, and how he's getting things ramped up uh, over there too, uh, it's, it will be a great uh, you know, overlook uh, for sure as well. Um, just, and that's it, uh, more, more details will be, uh, you know, uh, released and be working with, we'll be working with the Soil Water Conservation District. And I apologize, my slides weren't working, but um, thanks, thanks again, Camille, for the opportunity. Um, and thanks for everyone for keeping an eye out for this, these critters. critters. Um, the other last thing I did want to know is, as we're looking at uh, doing more stream stabilization around, uh, around the watershed, as we see these steep ravines, uh, we're really realizing it's not feasible to stabilize the streams in these steep ravines as much. And the best thing that we can do is protect these hemlocks, um, you know, so if we, we don't lose them. Um, and that's all I have, thanks again. Thanks so much, Frank. Um, so I know we are 
starting to run out of time, but we have time for a few questions. And I think um, Carrie's been answering some in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, the questions that I see um, in the Q&A. So the first one is, what are the impacts to bird populations from chemical application? I'll try to take that one. Um, we have not seen um, a lot of impact on birds. Uh, we also, there also is not also a lot of data on that, but the birds that are dependent on hemlocks are not going to be able to survive without the hemlocks. And, and so this is one of those situations where you have to, again, you have to weigh the risks of the treatment versus the risks of losing the, that ecosystem. Great. Um, someone said, as in 2019, I had all my hemlock trees along Sydney Atlas Lake treated by a professional with the basal bark treatment. There are woolly adelgids on some of those trees as well as new infestations. Should I have these retreated? They hold the steep bank along the shoreline. Can I use a drench treatment away from the lake? Um, let's see, is that one, can I, can I see the, the Q&A? Okay. Yeah, you should be able to. Yeah, I see it. I do a better job reading. Um, do you know what it was treated with? Um, if it was treated with, um, I guess two questions. If it's a very, you're seeing just a couple of HWA, um, I would go out and look again because if it was treated with imidacloprid, remember it takes a year for that to work. And so I would go out this spring in like June and look at the new growth, the lime green new growth and see if you're seeing any of those um, little crawlers settling, take out a magnifying glass, because it's possible that what you're seeing is leftover wool from um, early 2020 before that um, imidacloprid went into effect. Um, and then, yes, you would see new infestations um, if you're in an area that has a lot of HWA, if you didn't treat some of your trees. Um, Another question that I saw that I think would be a good one to point out is, what is the name of the website to report HWA, HWA infestations? That's IMAP, New York IMAP Invasives, and I'm just going to go grab that for you. Um, and drop it in here. But if you just Google New York IMAP Invasives, it'll come right up. You could, uh, away from the stream, I guess you could do a soil drench, but again, if you're concerned about the impact of the metapopard on the insects and other, but maybe birds on your property, um, when you do a soil drench, that's going to be picked up by any plant that has roots in the area where you apply the soil drench. And if you have flowering trees, that is going to potentially impact your pollinators. Um, Betsy asked, how can individuals financially support biological control initiatives directly to Mark Whitmore um, or another way? You can, you can donate to the New York State Hemlock Initiative. Um, we don't have like a donate button, but I'm, for instance, um, we were really good partners with Bob Duckett. And when he passed, he asked that in lieu of flowers, people donate to the Hemlock Initiative. And um, people were very, very generous with, with that. And we were super grateful. And I wanted to mention that in the chat, I put in the link to the video that we did of Bob Duckett that I thought you guys might like and you might enjoy getting a chance to see him talk about him. Um, yes, well, it is possible to spread HWA if you go out between about April and June. 
So that I would I would skip surveying in the spring. If you do go out survey in the spring, go until you hit HWA and then go home. Um, so that you don't accidentally get some crawlers or egg masses on you and then go survey an uninfested stand and spread it. Having said that, we've worked very hard to infest trees for our research and it's it's not easy. <laughs> we still wouldn't recommend that you do it, but um, it's not it's not like a it's not they're not great hitchhikers. Another question is, um, how are you using the small hemlock planting at the southwestern end of Skinny Atlas near the Syracuse Water Department? It's one of the ones we've been trying to invest with HWA. Um, if we can get it to a good infestation there, we will use it as a biocontrol release site. Great. Um, so we're at 11 o'clock, so I don't want to keep people um, too long. There are still a lot of questions, but um, Carrie, maybe if you want to put your contact information in the chat and people can reach out to you if they have um, questions or more specific. Um, I also think it would be great if we could share the tool that you talked about. So I can share that in, in the follow-up email too. Yeah, you know what? I answered all those questions in the all panelist mode. So um, I'm putting out again that link to Bob Duckett and then John, I think I just copied and pasted that one. Um, it doesn't prevent future biological management. No. And there's the IMAP invasives link. I see you already did that one. Actually, so let me do that one. Yeah, just for IMAP invasives, um, in the evaluation that I created for this program, which I'll send out at the end, um, I'm asking if you guys are interested in an IMAP Invasives training. Um, I am a certified trainer, so I could do a training for you guys if you're interested. So let me know either through that evaluation um, or just send me an email. Um, yeah, I think otherwise, I just wanna thank um, Harry again for a great presentation and Frank for joining us and giving an update about the Skinny Atlas Lake Association, um, stay tuned for an email from me um, with follow-up with resources, um, the recording of the presentation and um, an evaluation form. Um, otherwise, thank you all very much for joining us today and I hope you have a great rest of your day and a wonderful week. Thank you all and good luck with your homeworks. Yeah, good luck everyone. Thank you so much, Carrie, and thank you, Frank. Um, I'm probably gonna send you guys a follow-up email just to get some of the resources from you. Um, but yeah, thank you both for joining us. Thank, thanks, Camille, and sorry about the technical difficulties on my end. I, I got flustered and didn't, uh, didn't uh, you know, do it uh, correctly there, I guess. But you did a great job summarizing the information, so. <laughs> Yeah. It's yeah. all about the adapt adaptation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think technology is it's great. It's connecting us all through this yeah. pandemic, but sometimes, you know, you, you can't can't predict what technology is going to do. So no, I, it was hiding behind a couple of screens the, uh, where it expand my controls. So uh, thanks. Enjoy the week. Appreciate the opportunity and, uh, you know, more to more to come on these uh, critters for sure. Uh, and thanks. Looking forward to working with you both uh, on, on attacking this. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you. And Camille, thanks so much for setting this up. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, guys. Have a good rest of your day.